I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Thank you for listening to Bible Talks. I'm Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. We invite you to worship with us every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Our building is located at 689 North Main Street in Russellville. And just come, bring your Bibles, let's study God's Word together. But if at any time throughout the week you'd like to study God's Word, just call on us. We'd be happy to meet with you at the building or uh, anywhere, uh, your home, our homes, uh, the city park, and just talk about godly things. And so we hope to get to know you. We ask that you join us in our study today by opening your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. But we also want to remind you that you can find this program not only here on WRUS every Saturday morning at 9.05, uh, but you can also find it on WRUSradio.com. And you can find a video version on the YouTube channel for Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky. And you can see a uh, video version of this program and many other studies that we've had. Last week, we had a um, gospel meeting from, from about Sunday to Wednesday. So we have several lessons that will be appearing soon on our YouTube channel. So you'll have the opportunity to go back and revisit some of those if you did not have a chance uh, to visit with us and hear some excellent lessons. I might put some snippets of those lessons on Bible Talks over the next few weeks. So look forward to that. Today, though, I'd like to take a... a, a different direction in our study and look at the subject of grace. Um, it's, of course, and should be a very popular subject among Christians, uh, but sometimes in our world today the um, idea of grace has been misconstrued and misunderstood to the point that some people just look at God uh, being gracious to us all, granting us a home in heaven regardless of our faults, our circumstances, our sins even, and um, just want God to do all the work. We're going to be looking at the example of Noah. So if you'll turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, we'll be looking at some examples. Um, and really, this is the first time that the word grace is mentioned in the Bible. And that is through the example of Noah. And of course, famously, as Genesis 6 and verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is after God, of course, looks at the world and sees all the sins and the wickedness of mankind. And uh, a lot of people don't seem to understand that in many ways our world has become much like that again. And so there will be a time, though, since we know that the Lord will not destroy this earth with a uh, flood. Uh, he has given us the rainbow in the sky to promise us of that. We do know that in the end, though, on the day of judgment, that he will destroy this earth with fervent fire. And those that are righteous in his sight will have the opportunity to uh, rise in the air to meet the Lord and spend eternity with him in heaven. That's very far-fetched uh, for many in our modern society, uh, but at the same time, everyone wants the blessings of God. Grace, just by definition, is sometimes known as favor or kindness, and that's shown without regard to the worth or the merit of one who receives it. And in spite of what that person deserves, grace is one of the key attributes of God in our salvation. And this is taken primarily from Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary, uh, de defining probably more so God's character in looking at this uh, word grace. God is merciful. He is gracious. He is long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. That's what Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6 teaches us. And so we see that grace is always associated with words like love and mercy, compassion and patience, which are some of the key factors in who we are as Christians today. Uh, at the same time, uh, we try to define grace you know, by means that sometimes alleviates responsibility on our part. Now, don't get me wrong. We need Jesus Christ. We need God's plan of salvation, and I believe that's what grace is all about, just the very opportunity that God has given us to be saved. But he's also given us, if you will, a, a set of rules to live by. A lot of people in the religious world even um, aren't too comfortable with that. They don't want to look at the Bible as being a book of rules. They say, well, the Old Testament was rules. It was law, but we're under grace in Jesus Christ. Well, let's not redefine grace to mean something other than it is. It is God's plan of salvation. And in that plan of salvation, which he uh, gave us and accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, we then have the opportunity to be saved. We have the opportunity to be qualified 
as Colossians chapter 1 teaches us. And we'll be looking at that a little bit later in the lesson. But let's look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8 where it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. After God sees the wickedness of man and determines to destroy this earth through flood, he gives an opportunity for the earth to be replenished. He gives an opportunity for the salvation of mankind. And so in essence, we are all descendants of, of Noah in that respect. And in the fact that um, he provided for the animals and the plant life and everything of this earth to grow and to be sustained, much as we see it today. Uh, God has always made plans and prepared man uh, for his salvation and told us what was going to come next. So for over 100 years, he warns. He gives Noah the commission to build a great ark. And in that, he also takes the opportunity to preach unto man um, what we'll just call the gospel, uh, a plan of salvation. And it's as simple as joining Noah in his quest on the ark, joining Noah, I believe, in his faith and serving God. But of course, the world refused and they were destroyed. When we look at the idea that God uh, or that grace is often defined as God unmerited favor, uh, that sometimes takes a little explanation, you might say. That's kind of the go-to definition that people like to, to use, but then well, what, what does that mean? We all want the favor of God. And sadly, some people just look at favor as being, you know, individual, you know, the individual graciousness of God on them. Oftentimes, they don't define grace as the overall plan of salvation. You're going to hear me use that word a lot because that's what grace is. And God accomplished that through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. He died upon the cross, becoming that ultimate sacrifice and establishing a covenant between us and him. And we find similar things in the story of Noah. So Noah was found perfect, if you will, in God's eyes. And he was our example of receiving grace because, as we'll see in this lesson, he was faithful to God. He was faithful through obedience. In fact, the scripture says he was a perfect man. Now, people throw up their hands and say, oh, no, we, we can't be perfect. No. Well, you know, God actually commands us in scripture to walk worthy of his calling. We are to walk in his grace. We have responsibilities to be qualified, as I said earlier from Colossians chapter 1, which we'll read in a few moments. But I think people today look at grace as something that overrides their faults. In other words, they can still have their faults and they can still participate in their sin, but you know, God's grace is too great. And they like to throw out little memes and little phrases like you do on Twitter or something like that and talk about God's grace and really redefine it. And it's comforting. The way that people want to talk about grace is encourages people that God's going to save you no matter what. Um, but sometimes it can be misleading. And sometimes it can be out and out false teaching, as we'll see again in just a few moments. Now, understand this. Though people treat grace as though it's completely undeserved, without the merits of those who receive it, it might not be quite accurate to always describe it in that way. Because, yes, we should look at ourselves as undeserving. We're unworthy. I'm not going to deny that. But what God has done through his word has given us conditions by which we may be worthy. In fact, it's a command. He says to walk worthy of the calling, Paul says in Ephesians. So anyone could have received God's grace, even in the days of Noah. He offered it through the preaching of Noah, and they all refused. And they were subsequently drowned in the great flood. So what set Noah apart from other men a lone man in the entire world, he and, and his family, I believe his family, were qualified. Uh, not a lot is said distinctly about their faith, but I think because Noah was noted as a faithful man, he also ensured that his, his family, his children were as well. And so what set him apart from the rest of the wicked world? Well, first we need to look at the purpose of grace and why this term grace is used uh, to describe what God you know, offered Noah and what God sees in Noah. Um, and so he's the perfect example. Grace gives the opportunity for salvation. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. As we look at some New Testament equivalents to understanding what grace is all about, Titus 2, in the words of Paul the Apostle, says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, that's the same thing that happened with Noah. God, and of course, we're talking in Titus 2 about Jesus Christ himself. 
but also through the fact that through Noah's teaching, through the preparations of the ark, God gave an opportunity for man to be saved. And so it was there. Anyone have that opportunity? Why would Noah preach for a century to encourage people to stay away from the ark? No, to come into the ark. And so it goes on to say in verse 12, teaching us that. Now, that, I want to stop, stop there for just a moment, you know, and just look, let's look at the basic understanding of, of words like this. You know, grace involves teaching. It involves understanding. It involves learning. It involves application. So he goes on to say, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. He doesn't say in spite of ungodliness and worldly lust. He says, teaching us that we must deny these very things. And so he says, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Yes, God wants us to walk worthy, and this, or this is the walk that we should have. This is the walk that Noah had. If you look, and we'll see in just a little while, do some things about Noah and his very character and who he was as a man and his service to God. Part of that is all about how he walked. And so it goes on in verse 13 of Titus 2 to say, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, if we're truly looking for something, if we're looking for that salvation, aren't we going to do all that we can to obtain it? In verse 14 it says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Yet those are things that people deny today, even in the religious communities. Oh, you don't need to work. You know, work won't save you. Well, you know, God prescribed for us works to do. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 is very clear that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So in a sense, figuratively, we're building an ark. If Noah had not built that ark, and built it to the proper specifications of which God gave, the right dimensions, the right size, even the right kind of wood. Well, you know, he wouldn't have been obedient to God. He wouldn't have been deserving, if you will, of that salvation. And some people say, well, it wouldn't have floated or whatever. Remember this, it's not about technical dimensions or science or anything like that. God can do anything he so desires to do. And he can take a box and throw it in the ocean and make it float. As it was already pointed out from the New Testament scripture, Jesus could turn bread uh, from rocks. God can do anything. He can raise the dead. He can do anything, but he limits himself, pardon the expression, but he, he holds himself back from a lot of things that he could do because he wants us to fulfill our responsibilities. He could reach down and yank us right into heaven, but that's not his plan of salvation. And if he were to do that, he would be denying his own grace. And so we've got to consider things like that. What's my role? What's my responsibility in these things? Noah's the perfect example. So grace gave the opportunity for salvation, as we read in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Grace teaches that plan of salvation, as we read in verse 12. And grace also gives us the blessings and the reward of salvation. And so there are, uh, you know, many ways to define it as far as the, the um, institution of it, incorporation of it, the um, carrying it out, uh, the manifestation of it, and of course the blessings and the reward of it. All those things are grace, all packaged together. But we can't ignore one part in order to achieve another. We can't jump right to the blessings and the reward and forget everything else about the way God carries out grace. Grace is not just something that's a free-for-all. And unfortunately, again, that's the way it's taught in many so-called churches today. And it's the way many brethren are starting to think about grace because they want God to fill in all these gaps of which they don't understand. But remember this. God has given us everything we need to know pertaining to our salvation. So when you sit back and you're worried about what you don't know, go and learn it. Search the scriptures to find out what is so. That's what the Bible actually says. <laughs> and so how can we find grace? Well, it's quite simple, really. Remember this, that grace is not about your emotions. It's not about your feelings. There are feelings and emotions incorporated in those things. 
But Colossians 3, verses 1 through, 2, 1 through 2, says to look to the things that are above, not to the things of the earth. If we're looking down for grace, we're not looking up to God. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, our Lord in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. He incorporates our daily living and the things that we must rely upon in our physical needs in carrying those things out, but putting God first in all things. When we, quote unquote, go to church, you know, usually a service, you know, incorporates singing and praying, hearing a message of God's word and partaking of the Lord's Supper, remembering that Jesus uh, gave his life upon the cross. And then, of course, the last thing that all churches practice, but a lot of them don't like to talk about it, is the money giving back to God what he has graciously blessed us with. And so a lot of times people aren't putting that first. They aren't putting those elements first. In fact, they'll come prepared to go that afternoon to spend a lot of money on a meal. But they'll give God the leftovers, you might say. They give God the bare minimum of what they can. May I suggest to you that you, in your budgeting, when... You know, before your car payment, before your house payment, before your insurance, before your your grocery bill, that you put God at the top of your list, even regarding your budget. And he takes care of his people. I have no doubt about that. Jesus Christ said it. Seek first the kingdom of God. These things, the things that he mentioned in the previous verses in Matthew 6, had to do with our clothing and our food. And, you know, he says, you, you, you put God first, he's going to take care of you in regard to those things. Maybe not miraculously. You still got to work for them. But God always provides the opportunity, and I've never seen a true Christian go hungry. And that's one of the ways that God carries out his will and his grace in this world is through the efforts of man, through the fellowship that we have among fellow Christians. That's why the command is given over and over again in Scripture to love one another so that we don't go hungry, that we don't go without. But we have to be in a right relationship with God. Well, let's go on in looking again at some more examples of Noah here as being our example of one that received the grace of God. He was also given instructions, wasn't he? So this brings up the question, why don't why doesn't everyone receive God's grace? Well, just think about it. If Noah had not followed the commands of God, would he received God's grace? There's a term called Calvinism. It's false teaching. But uh, many religious groups, um, some of them practice the elements of, of false teaching. Just do a little Google search and look up, you know, the tulip, you know, uh, idea of Calvinism. But uh, a couple things that it teaches is, one, unconditional election. That God handpicks those who will be saved regardless of their actions and faith. And they flower it up. Oh, it's, it's the love of God. This is the power of God. You know, he, he can save you regardless of your sins. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 does talk about the power of God. It says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, the words of God, the same as the doctrine, the teaching, what we would call the Bible, God's message to man. And so they also teach something called irresistible grace. Because if God's going to handpick a few folks to be saved, then they just can't help themselves. They're going to be good people. They're going to be churchgoers. And basically God is controlling people like marionettes, you know, puppets on a string. This teaches the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on hearts of those that God has already chosen to be saved. Well, that, that's a false doctrine. <laughs> In fact, the Bible over and over again teaches exactly the opposite of irresistible grace. The wording appeals to people, though. But let's look at what the Bible has to say about a few of these things. In Acts 17, 26-27, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. He has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of the dwellings so that they should seek the Lord. There are things that God has predetermined. He's predetermined that if a man, and remember what I just said, if, all of this is conditional. Because if we are obedient to God, it says... We'll seek him. And then he says, in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. He's out there doing his work. He has given us this grace through his son, Jesus Christ. It is available for all to partake of. The gospel is for all. 
in Titus chapter 2, verses 11, as we read earlier. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to men, but what are the conditions of that? I'll remind us again. To deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Ungodliness and worldly lust are the things that separate us from our relationship with God. In Romans 10, 16 through 17, he warns of the generation of that time. Much like today, go back and read Romans chapter 1 and tell me it doesn't sound like our society today. He says in Romans 10, 16 through 17, but not all, excuse me, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I have a responsibility toward the word of God because that's his grace that he has given to us so that we can learn, so that we can understand. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 21, just some good practical teaching here. He says, But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That's repentance. And that's what we must all have in coming to the Lord. You know what I find interesting about Noah is that you don't see a lot about his repentance. Now, Noah's a man. He made mistakes. We see that even after the incident with the ark. But um, what he was was a man that walked perfectly and justly in the sight of God. That is what's specifically said about Noah. Let's contrast that with the state of the world at this time. In Genesis 6, Genesis 6, going back there to verse 5, some people say it's unfair for God to condemn the world because men were not perfect. Well, we're not talking about just imperfect men. We're talking about wicked men. We're talking about people that purposely go against the principles and the laws of God. And I'm going to read this for you, and then we're going to be out of time, so we may have to pick up with this uh, at the end of this lesson next week. But verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Do you know you can grieve God today? You can grieve the Holy Spirit through disobedience, through wickedness, through only thinking of evil continually. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. In 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do we think Noah inherited the kingdom of God? Inherited the kingdom of God. And why was that? As we'll see and pick up in our lesson next week, he was just. He was perfect. He walked with God. And he was in a covenant relationship with him because he was obedient and God accounted it to him for righteousness. What is our state with God today? Are we qualified? I'd like to relieve you with one last verse before we close. And that is uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, so I'll just have to hurry through it and uh, then leave you to ponder on it for this week. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That's grace. So what do you think? Are you qualified? How can we help? Call on us. The Northside Church of Christ meets in Russellville, Kentucky. Email us, northsidechurchofchrist at hotmail.com. We'd love to talk to you about these things. And we'll study these things further. So keep reading about Noah and how he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we'll see you next time on Bible Talks. Since I have been
I am spirit, I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, spirit, I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name.